Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> that didn't work. Let's try this. There we go. What a wonderful day of fellowship together. Amen? Amen. I, you know, I know you guys. Oh, yesterday was gorgeous. It was nice and it was sunny. I haven't been able to water my lawn yet. So today is perfect. <laughs> so long as tomorrow the sun comes back out. Not that I'm picky. <laughs> um, a couple of things that I wanted to address real quick. Last week we had a horrible oversight, and I want to address that. Um, all the men that came out and prepared the Mother's Day breakfast, uh, I think you guys deserve a very hearty applause. Uh, the breakfast was fantastically done. We're applauding the men for fixing Mother's Breakfast on Mother's Day, but uh, it was just incredible. Um, I didn't get to do anything. As a matter of fact, I was told to go sit down. So, uh, thank you guys for stepping up and doing that. That was a blessing. I know to the women, several of them commented what a blessing it was. It was also a blessing to me, so thank you. Um, also, uh, yesterday, we had the, the Hunter's Big Moving Day. And uh, by the time I got there, they were just about done. <laughs> we got there at, uh, what, what time did we actually get there? About 9 Idaho time, I think, 9.15. Yeah. And they had four or five pieces of furniture to put in the truck, which I couldn't help with anyway. <laughs> so we stood there and cheered them on. <laughs> yes! You guys are awesome! Uh, so thank you for all the men that came out yesterday, uh, the trucks and the trailers that were brought out. Uh, I love seeing Jesus Community Church rally together to accomplish great things. It's, it's a, a marvelous thing. So Today, we are continuing in our Essentials of the Faith. And we're going to be talking about some stuff that uh, is kind of hard to wrap our brains around. Well, maybe not for you, but it's hard for me to wrap my brain around. As a matter of fact, I can't. Um, so far we have covered the, the inerrancy of God's Word. We can trust it. God has had His hand on it. It's trustworthy. We have covered that there is one God, co-eternal, co-existent in three parts, the triune God. And we looked at that over the space of a couple of weeks. And today we're going to move into um, really defining the second person of the Trinity, uh, the person of Jesus Christ. And see, this, this kind of brings us to a whole spectrum of essentials to our faith. Because really, what, what separates us from a lot of other cultures is Jesus Christ. Okay? There's a, there's a lot of religions and there's a lot of faith systems out there that have a God. They don't have the God. They have a God. There are some that are out there that believe in the same God we do, but not in the same way that we do. Um, unfortunately, there are some that, that deny the deity of Jesus Christ. And so what, what really separates Christians from the rest of the world is our faith in Jesus Christ, who he was and what he did. Okay? And so we're going to talk a little bit about this today and, and next week because, you know... <coughs> The thing that I really want to deal with today is incarnation. Okay? That's, that's derived just from Latin. It just means in the flesh. Okay? In the flesh. Um, I know there are other essentials that we have to deal with with Jesus. Uh, the virgin birth, we have to deal with that. We will deal with that next week. We have to deal with his perfect sinless life, his uh, sacrifice on our behalf, his death and resurrection, the efficacy of what he did. And we will deal with that later. But really, all of that stands pale if we don't understand who he was. Okay? And we really have to get a good grasp on this because there's a lot of misrepresentation of who he was. There's a lot of misapprehension as to what this dynamic nature that Jesus was. What is that? And so we're going to talk about this today. 
But I'm going to throw out a fancy word for you. You guys ready? You want to write this down? Hypostatic union. H Y P O S T A T I C. Hypostatic, one word, union. Now, this is a fancy way of describing the nature of Jesus Christ. Now, if I were standing, you guys could see this a little better. I'll, I'll try and sit up. This is how my professor in college did it. The hypostatic union means that he is fully God and fully man. Okay? Thank you, Dr. Dunstan. <laughs> fully God and fully man. Now, why is it important that we understand and appreciate this? <clears throat> we have to understand that Jesus Christ called himself God. At one and the same time, he also was fully human. Now this is where things bend our brains. And I've got a lot of scripture we're going to go through. Again, if anybody wants a copy of my notes, I'll be happy to make a copy for you afterwards. Um, why is it important? One, it is important because Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Okay? So blood had to be shed. Unfortunately, the blood of sheep and goats and bulls was insufficient. Hebrews makes that very clear to us. You know, every year they had to keep coming back and offering the same sacrifices. You imagine how many sheep and goats and bulls were slaughtered? And yet every year they would do it again. Every year. Over and over and over again. Why? They were insufficient. They couldn't take the sin away. All they could do was cover over it. So there was a necessity for a perfect and pure sacrifice. Now, I don't understand a lot of things about God. I don't understand a lot of things. The more I understand, the more I realize I don't understand. What I do know is that while we tend to dwell on God being perfect in love, we tend to neglect that God is also perfect in justice. He requires perfect justice. When there is sin, when there is a missing of the mark, we, we didn't do what he called us to do, there's separation. Okay? That's his nature. He's holy. He's perfect. He's separate. He's unique. When there is sin, that is us pulling away from God. All right? We have withdrawn from Him. Now, all of us have sinned. We, we know that um, throughout the Old and the New Testament. Romans makes it very clear. How many have sinned? All, all of us. Who hasn't sinned? Nobody. Nobody. Everybody sinned. So, as a result of everybody's sin, everybody is removed from God. Okay? So God desired a way in which man could be restored, which would fulfill not only his perfect love, but also fulfill his perfect justice. Payment had to be made. Okay? Now, why... Did God have to become flesh to do it? Well, we understand from Paul's writings that when sin entered through Adam, it infected the entire race. Now, I know people, there's a lot of debate, there's a lot of theology, a lot of argument. Does, okay, does that mean that, you know, the babe comes out of the womb a sinner? Or do they actually have to commit a sin? They're just bound to commit a sin. The scripture says all of sin. It says that through the sin of one man, death came to all men. All right? I don't get really into those arguments. They use a lot of terms I don't care about. What I know is I was separated from God. I don't care if it happened in the womb, out of the womb, when I committed my first lie. That doesn't matter to me. I know I was separated from God. Now... For those of you that look at the innocence of children, you're not looking very closely. <laughs> Just say it. I love my grandchildren, 
but there is sin all over them. <laughs> and sometimes it just oozes. Okay? And I look at the innocence of, you know, Annalisa giving me those big blue eyes and that smile and trying to steal something from me. <laughs> so sweet, but no. You can't. That's wrong. And I watch as Titus and Judah, they love each other. <laughs> Okay, that would be something that God would not be pleased with. Pick him up. So I understand, you know, when a baby dies, does a baby go to heaven? I thank God that he makes that choice, yes. not me, mm -hmm. and not you. Okay, because he's perfect in all knowledge and all wisdom. So I don't, have, I don't worry about that. Okay? Don't you worry about it either. Trust God. Let that him deal with it. So, sin has come to all men. All of us. They're no better, no worse than anyone else. And see, we like to quantify and classify sin. Oh, yeah, you know, I mean, you got to look at people like Hitler. I never did anything like Hitler. You sinned. You have separated yourself from God. Do you, do you understand? The only alternative to being with God is to spending eternally, eternity apart from God, which the only place you can do that is hell. So I don't care if you get the 300 degree hell or the 3000 degree hell. <laughs> That's irrelevant. The point is you are spending eternity separated from God. You get it? Do we understand? Yep. Because see, there's a lot of pride that comes in when we start measuring ourselves up against worse people than us. And do you see the sin right there? That's pride, which God rejects. God actually resists. He opposes. Okay? So we have this understanding, one, that we are sinners. On that other side of that, we understand that God is perfect in His judgment, that we are sinners. And because of that, a price has to be paid for reconciliation, for restoration. Okay? So, God determined... Man can't do it. There is no one, from the moment Adam sinned, there is no one for all of eternity that is ever going to be perfect enough to make the perfect sacrifice. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create something unknown to this point. We are going to take ourselves, God, the fullness of God, and we are going to combine that. We are going to join to that man. Alright? Now, God came down and the Holy Spirit was on Mary. She became pregnant. you got to wonder. I tell you what, if you people do not appreciate Joseph, you got to get back in the Word and appreciate Joseph. you got to appreciate Joseph. Because here's a man, first he shows his honor and that he's going to put her off quietly because of the shame. He does. I mean, really? If she's pregnant, you know what? The natural course is throwing rocks. Take her outside the city gate, start heaving rocks. But he's going to put her off quietly. I think that demonstrates an incredible heart for Mary. Okay? And then God speaks to him and says, No, I've done this. Sends an angel in and says, I've done this. Don't be afraid to take her to your wife. What a dream. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. She's never been with a man, Joseph. God has done this. And you wake up and got to act on it. Okay. So, we have God joining with man, becoming something new. This is the hypostatic union. Fully God, and yet at one and the same time, fully man. Now, people get all tripped up. How could he be fully God and be a baby? I mean, really. He pooped. <laughs> he needed his diaper change. That can't be God. Yeah, I can. Look, God is so much bigger than we are. We can't wrap our brains around, our brains around him. Trust him. Okay? He knows what he's doing. If he didn't know what he's doing, we, above all people, are without hope. That's right. Okay? We have no hope. So trust Him. 
So, let's look at some scriptures. Okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly through these. Um, there is one that I'll have you turn to in a little bit. Uh, John 1, 1, and then I'm going to skip down to verse 14. It's actually on the front of your bulletin. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, it goes on to say, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, taking these two verses together, and actually that's an excellent passage to read when you're looking for the divinity of Christ. I think John does an incredible job, both poetically and just very literally, telling us what is. Okay? In the beginning was the Word. Who is the Word? Well, in verse 14 he says it's the only Son from the Father, Jesus. Okay? So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Okay, they're together. All right, I can understand that. Mormons got that. Jehovah's Witness got that. Oh, wait a minute. He didn't stop there. And the Word was God. Did you catch that? You need to wrap your brain around this. The Word was God. All right? Hold on to that thought for just a minute. So, when the earth was created, Jesus was already with God and was already God. Okay? He didn't come to earth through a miraculous birth and then become God. Okay? That's a lie. There's not this demigod status that some people want to attribute to him. That he somehow, through the righteousness of his life, attained God-likeness. That's not what happened. In the beginning, he was already God. Okay? So, then he comes to earth, takes on flesh, and dwells among us. Now see, there's another thing we have to understand. One of the things that you need to appreciate when you read through the Gospels, Jesus was flesh. Ouch! Alright? He had all those things that were required to make him fully man. <coughs> the reason I say this is because there are people that want to promote the idea that he was not fully man, that somehow he was God and something else. Because he couldn't be like us, or he wouldn't be God. Look, if you could understand him, he's not God. Get it? Okay? If you can fit the infinity of God into your tiny, finite brain, you're deluded. That's not God. Okay? So, let's jump ahead. John chapter 10, verses 30 through 33, says, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I and the Father are one. Now, something really weird happens here, and we need to pay attention to this. Okay? Jesus says, I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. <laughs> Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. You get that? Do you see what Jesus just did? He declared himself equal to the Father. He is saying, hey look, you see this, this flesh and blood person here? By the way, I'm God. Okay? Now, in their thinking, they did exactly what the law required. They picked up rocks to stone him. Okay? But do you catch what he says down here at the end? The Jews say, it's not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a... Man, make yourself God. Well, he didn't make himself God. He just was God. You get that? It's not like um, at some point throughout the course of eternity, a medallion just appeared on him declaring him God. He just was. 
You know? It's like saying, at some point in my life, I made myself Glenn. <laughs> no, pretty much just been Glenn ever since I can remember. Never been anybody else. You know? John 20, verse 28. Thomas answered him. Now this is after the resurrection. All right? And Thomas comes to the other disciples and they say, We've seen him! We've seen him! He's alive! He says, yeah, yeah. Not till I touch him. <laughs> he gets a bad rap. Thomas really does. He gets a bad rap. Because everybody thinks, Oh, you know, the disciples, they were right on. Remember what happened when Mary came? <laughs> you know? Little early Mary. <laughs> they didn't believe either until Jesus appeared to them. So then Jesus appears and he tells Thomas, Thomas, where? Put your finger where the holes are. I wasn't there. And Thomas answered him, saying, My Lord and my God. Oh my. Philippians 2. This is, you guys have heard me quote this one a lot. This is one of my favorite verses. One of my favorite passages. This is Paul writing to the Philippians. And he says, uh, starting in verse 5, Philippians 2, verse 5, he says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, okay, you follow the flow of this logically, okay, he was in the form of God, so he already was God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Not for his sake, for our sake. He understood it because he was God. You get it? Because, you know, as God, he knows everything. So when he's saying, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, he's talking about us. We couldn't grasp it. Okay? But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now, I want to come back here. I want to point something out to you. But emptied himself. See, a lot of people take that and they go, Ah! He got rid of his deity. See, it says right there, he emptied himself. No, no. It doesn't work that way. Why? What is, you, you heard me say before, what is the first rule of hermeneutics, of Bible study. Okay, the first rule of hermeneutics is that all scripture is interpreted in light of all scripture. You don't just take a verse and run with it. You look at it and see what it says in the rest of scripture regarding that verse. Okay, for example, you would be foolish if you just took and ran with Judas went and hanged himself. And then flipped over and read, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> you wouldn't do that, would you? I would hope not. Okay? I would hope that you would study that in light of what all of it is saying. But I really don't want your bowels gushing out anywhere. So, we look at this in light of all scripture. So when it says, he emptied himself, what does that mean? I have some ideas about that. We'll come back to that in a little bit, because we're going to touch on this verse a little bit later. Hebrews 1.8. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Do you get that? To the Son, he says, To the Son, he says, Your throne, O God. You get the picture? Jesus was God. He was also man. Colossians 2.9, this is where I'm going to touch back to um, Philippians. Colossians 2.9 says, For in Him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Okay? You get that? We took an earthen jar and filled it with God. Do you, you get that? See, that's why when it says He emptied Himself, we can't take that that He got rid of His deity because we have scriptures that tell us He didn't get rid of His deity. So what did he get rid of? What did he get rid of? Yeah. 
He subjected himself to, one, the will of the Father, but he also submitted himself to the will of man. Remember? As a sheep led to the slaughter, he remained silent. I mean, you listen to the garbage they were spewing about him. You don't think Jesus could have given a credible defense on his own? I mean, come on, look at how he dealt with the Jews all throughout. All, every time the Pharisees came at him, they went away looking foolish. Is it right to pay taxes? Well, who, whose picture is that? Well, it's Caesar's. You give to Caesar what's Caesar, but give to God what is God's. Huh? Well, tell us then by what authority you do these things. Where does your authority go? Oh, let me ask you a question. I'll answer yours, you get yours. The baptism of John, where, where, where did that come from? Was that from God or from man? Let us convene a council. <laughs> hey guys, if we say it's from God, he's going to ask why we didn't listen. And that's not good. Because all these people are going to hear that we didn't listen. But if we say it's from man, they're going to be mad at us because they think he was from God. I know. Let's plead ignorance. We don't know. <laughs> I don't know. He was. Uh... We have to go sacrifice something. <laughs> so think about this realistically for a moment, okay? If he is standing before them, and every time they have come against him, using the law that they were trying to pin him down with. He turns it around and shows them the truth of what they were misunderstanding and how foolish they are. You don't think if he was standing before the Sanhedrin, he could not have done the same thing? Or when he went before Pilate, he could not have done the same thing? So what did he do? He humbled himself. He set aside his rights, his privileges, as God. He didn't decide, set aside his authority or his power. <coughs> he was talking to Peter. What did he say? Don't you think I could command legions to come? Don't you think I could do that? I choose not to. So he's setting aside what is rightfully his. Why? To accomplish a greater purpose. Okay? So, the two natures. He is fully God, fully man. Not Half God, half man, not any other percentage. It is 100% God, 100% man. We don't get it because we are not. We're just 100% man. That's it. Uh, you know, we have God's spirit living in us. We have been regenerated, so we're not the same kind of man that they are out there. But we're not God. And you know what? Because there there's a teaching that goes around, and sometimes I hear it kind of bubble to the top again, is that, you know, when we get to heaven, we're, we're going to be like God. Okay, now, you need to understand life does not mean God. All right, we're not going to be God. We're not going to get up there and get to sit on the throne. It will be our privilege. It will be our delight. It will be our desire to bow before that throne. Okay? So, we don't get it because we're not there. Um, so, he was God at the start. He became man, but did not stop being God. We have the union in one person that is fully human and fully divine. Now, what is Jesus doing right now? He stands before the throne and mediates. He intercedes on our behalf. See, his work isn't done. The work of redemption there, yes. But he didn't just lay it down and say, hey, yeah, guess what? Party time! See you guys later. Going somewhere warm with water. <laughs> no. He, he laid down the work here and took up work there. Because we see in uh, 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. Do you get that? Do you see how significant that is? 
that the nature of man that Christ took upon himself, he still has some aspect of that. You get that? You get that in heaven, that, that there is an aspect to the nature of Jesus Christ that is still man? Do you, do you get that? Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing that for eternity, from eternity, for eternity, God would choose to do this for us. Okay? <coughs> now, there are two different things I'm going to point out to you here. I'm going to run through these pretty quick. I just want to point out scriptures. And you're going to see a difference because while I've been talking about he's fully God and he's fully man, I'm going to show you scriptures that indicate both. All right? Jesus says God. He was worshipped. Matthew 2.2 2 says that the, the wise men came and they're standing before Herod and they said, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Worship him. Now think about that for a moment. Okay? Now, why would these men be coming from afar off to worship a man? And why wouldn't Herod, one, as king, why would he want them to worship anybody? Two, as supposedly the king of the Jews, they're not supposed to worship any man. Why wouldn't he correct them here? Later down in verse 11, it says, And going to the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. They worshipped him. Wow. You get that? They worshipped him. He was prayed to. Did you know that people prayed to Jesus? Acts uh, chapter 7. The stoning of Stephen. Right. <coughs> Stephen is being martyred. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Hmm. Interesting. He is sinless, without sin. First Peter two twenty two says he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Hebrews four fifteen says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Do you, you realize that you have not gone and will not go through anything that Jesus did not overcome in the same set of circumstances that you're in? Okay? He was tempted in every way that we are, yet he remained sinless. He knows all things. He's talking with Simon Peter after the resurrection. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Now, we've talked about this before. If you ever get the opportunity, go back and look at this conversation, this dialogue, and take a look at the Greek words that are used each time Jesus asks this. And then look up what those Greek words mean. <coughs> because it will completely change how you view this passage. It will completely change how you look at this. Peter was grieved because he asked him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. How about John 10, 28? Guess what Jesus does in John 10, 28? He gives eternal life. Ooh, isn't that something that only God can do? says, uh, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Doesn't that sound like something only God can do? And then in Colossians 2.9, we already read this. <coughs> Excuse me. 
For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. He is God. Okay? Reconcile yourself to that. But at the same time, we see Jesus as man. John 17. Let's look at this real quick. This is actually a fantastic prayer that Jesus prays. <coughs> I'm just going to read through the whole thing, and then I just want to point out a couple of things for you. John chapter 17. Starting in verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in the truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I am I in you, that you also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. You guys see everything that Jesus is praying here? Did you catch that line that he said here? He says, I don't ask for these only. He's not talking about just the disciples that are there. But he says, but also for those who believe in me through their word. That would be you and I. Okay? He is asking that God would pour out on us what he poured out on Jesus. And that we would be one with him just as he is one with the Father. Okay? But there's a couple of things that I want you to see here. Did you notice that one, Jesus is worshiping the Father? Did you, did you pick that up? Did you notice that he is praying to the Father? See, this is that hypostatic union that we can't really wrap our brains around. Because he's fully God, why would he have to pray to anyone else? Because he's also fully man. Think about the Garden of Gethsemane. Crying out, grieved of spirit. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, was that God crying out? No. You don't think God could tune that out? That's the man crying out, God, I don't want to go through this. 
This is going to be hard. This is going to be grievous. Could there be another way? But not what I want. Okay. See, that's where we have to exist as Christians. Not what I want, God, but what you want. God, it's hard. I don't want to go through this. But not what I want, what you want. See, that's, that's the humanity right there. Okay? Jesus was tempted. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You get that? He went out to the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted. See, this, this again addresses the humanity of Jesus because James tells us God cannot be tempted. Right? James chapter 1. God does not tempt, he cannot be tempted. So, how do we deal with that? That's the humanity of Jesus. That is him being tempted under everything that we would be tempted and withstanding it and sinning not. Okay? The humanity of Jesus. He grew in wisdom. Um, Luke chapter 2 it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Now, i got to tell you, I almost didn't put this one in here because I don't get it. This is one I can't bend my brain around. I don't get it. He's fully God. What does he have to grow in? I don't get it. Why does he grow in favor with God? He is God. Shouldn't he like himself? What's not to like? Yeah. Okay. How about also that as he is withstanding temptation as man, God is pleased. Just as God is pleased when we withstand temptation. There's just a lot here that that, that is beyond my brain. Another point. He died. He died. Well, God can't die. God is eternal. God exists all the time. And yet, Jesus gave up his spirit and died. Romans 5.8 God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the man. That's the man. How about this? He has flesh and bones. All right? Let's, let's talk back to Thomas again. In Luke chapter 24. Speaking to Thomas, he said, See my hands and my feet? That it is I myself. Touch me. Touch me. And see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Isn't that cool? He became fully man that God's purposes would be accomplished. That they might be fulfilled. That the sin that entered this world through one man and the death that came with it might be overpowered by the righteous act of one man. Jesus, the second act. So, I have a whole list of Heresies regarding the Incarnation. We're not going to deal with them. We're not going to deal with them. Why? Because every time you learn a heresy and you understand a heresy, a new one pops up. I think it's better to know the truth. Okay? Don't deal with the falsehood so much. Deal with the truth, and the falsehoods will be readily apparent. Okay? If you understand the truth and you live in the truth, just as he prayed we would then the falsehoods, they're obvious. Okay? So, the hypostatic union, fancy word, meaning he was... you got to do the hand motions. It's not complete without the hand motion. Fully God and fully man. Okay? All right. Essentials to our faith. 
We have to understand this. We have to wrap our brain around this. We have to place our faith and our trust in this. Because without this, nothing that comes after this describing our redemption is possible. Okay? It becomes impossible. And then there's really no point in us getting together every Sunday because we're all lost anyway. Okay? Father, we bless you today. We honor you and we thank you, Father, for the truth of your word. Lord God, that you decided before the earth was created that you would make a way for my salvation, for our salvation. Father, for our redemption, that the purchase price would be paid for our sin. And that, Father, we would transfer ownership from slaves to sin and death to bond servants of you. Lord God, we would put aside the, the flesh and all the decay and garbage that comes with it. Father, we would take on your spirit and we would exchange death for life. I thank you, Father, that you made that way. And we bless you. We thank you and we praise you. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.